The Iraqis call him a national hero, but the Bible reveals him as a madman. Who was the legendary king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar? A legend and a mystery rolled into one in Babylon Mystery. Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, is between the Euphrates and the Tigris and was once the birthplace of culture. Over 2,500 years ago, a huge metropolis arose in the heart of this region, Babylon. The man who ruled over it made the city one of the wonders of the world, and his name was Nebuchadnezzar. The structures constructed by the king of the Euphrates became myths, like the huge Tower of Babel, which was to appeal to the imagination of generations to come. Today, only rubble remains, but modern archaeologists can gain an understanding of the lost world from the remaining fragments. Latest technology preserves the cuneiform signs, the oldest written language, on thousands of ancient tablets, and scientists can now decipher them. The images can bring the lost city of Babylon back to life, and with it comes a far greater understanding of Nebuchadnezzar and of the cosmology of the Babylonians. The rediscovery of Nebuchadnezzar's world began a hundred years ago in Lebanon. The French consul, Henri Poignot, explored the region round El Hermel in search of ancient artistic treasures. At the time, there were many expeditions by colonial administrators. The 19th century was the time of great discoveries. Wherever they went, they seemed to make new and important finds. The legendary city of Troy had been excavated. Egyptian hieroglyphics could be deciphered, and on a hot October day, Henri Poignot made a discovery that would later be acclaimed as an archaeological sensation. Poignot worked on the assumption that the vast empire of Babylon once extended to this point on the shores of the Mediterranean, and he discovered proof. On a stone wall, the portrait of a king had been chiseled out, overpowering a lion with his arm. According to the inscription, it was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. In the fading light of day, Henri Poignot managed to take a sensational photograph. This is the earliest depiction of Nebuchadnezzar that has been found. The weathered relief in stone unites ancient myths and legends. The kingdom ruled by Nebuchadnezzar benefited from the influence of the two great rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. As long ago as two and a half thousand years before Nebuchadnezzar, works of art were created that bear witness to the cultural achievements of the period and convey a curious picture of the people of that age. The Sumerian people created an entirely new culture heralded by a revolutionary development. The invention of cuneiform script 3,000 years before Christ and the cultural growth that resulted from the invention of a written language was to reach its pinnacle in Nebuchadnezzar's vast empire of Babylon. The new technology spread from ancient Uruk to the whole of Mesopotamia, extending far to the north. It also spread to the Mediterranean in the west and to the cultural sphere of Palestine. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom extended as far as Egypt and Jerusalem, a veritable empire. Jerusalem, the holy city of David and ancestral home of all Jews. But 2,600 years ago, it was not the sprawling metropolis that it is today. Protected by the city walls, 
no more than a few thousand Jews inhabited the small area around the Temple Mount. Nebuchadnezzar was able to breach the stone circle and leveled the holy city. An ancient relief depicts the battle. The Babylonians scaled the walls of the city with the help of fortified towers. The defenders could not match the superior military technology. The invaders had metal armor, stone catapults, and carefully planned strategies. The well-thought-out plans were highly effective, along with the devastating waves of arrows fired by thousands of archers. Nebuchadnezzar used his military might to good effect. Thousands of enemies were mown down, while the survivors were taken to Babylon as prisoners of war. For the Jews, it was a terrible catastrophe, the wrath of God, and Babylon was seen as the hated site of exile, with Babel known as the hotbed of vice. To this day, the remains of Babylon can be seen in Iraq. But at the beginning of the 20th century, all that could be seen of the former metropolis were foundation stones and rubble. The buildings, just 20 years old, are mere reconstructions. But these imaginative edifices do provide some concept of the splendor and glory of an ancient city that was home to a million inhabitants. The massive tiled walls of Babylon were counted among the seven wonders of the ancient world. But it was also claimed that there was a second wonder of the world to be admired in Babylon. The hanging gardens of Princess Semiramis, said to have been the mistress of Nebuchadnezzar. Though the historical truth behind this figure is also lost in the fairy tale legends that surround the city. The Greek historian Herodotus, who is believed to have visited Babylon a hundred years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar, was one of many people captivated by the capital. Herodotus marveled at the legendary dimensions of the Tower of Babel, though he could only guess as to its function. As he tried to describe the sights, he let his imagination run wild as he enthused about the city with streets 16 meters wide, walls 25 meters thick, and an urban area that stretched for 96 kilometers. And so the metropolis on the Euphrates became the subject of fantastic legends that were passed down through the generations until the German archaeologist, Robert Koldewey, decided to search for the truth at the beginning of the last century. When Koldewey reached the presumed site of the ancient city of Babylon, all that could be seen were piles of rubble covered by the drifting desert sands. But Koldewey was certain that the legendary Babel was buried there. The initial excavations revealed remains of vast city walls and confirmed his belief that only the capital of Babylon could have had such mighty defenses. Koldewey had found the remains of the walls that Herodotus had reported with such admiration and the Babylonians had insulated the tiled structures against humidity by using bitumen, an amazing technological achievement for the day. Koldewey was obsessed with the idea of excavating the whole of the legendary city. For 18 years, even during the First World War, he excavated the site almost without interruption. Today, his followers still work with shovels and spades. The excavations that began in Iraq a hundred years ago have taken them on an archaeological journey back through time 
to the Empire of Babylon. In Sippar, a good 50 kilometers from Koldui's excavations, the team have discovered a new archaeological sensation, a library from the period of Nebuchadnezzar. However, the archaeologists aren't looking for works of art or precious metals, but a far more valuable treasure, inscribed tablets. Cuneiform writing thousands of years old, recording the ideas and beliefs of Babylonians in Nebuchadnezzar's day. The archaeologists have been able to unearth over 300 clay tablets, valuable texts describing rites and customs, myths and politics. The library of Sippar is literally a treasure trove of knowledge. But first, the knowledge has to be decoded. Deciphering texts like this is a race against time, as experts on cuneiform script, like Professor Sommerfeld at the Museum of Baghdad, watch the ancient clay tablets decay before their eyes. Though the clay tablets are far less susceptible to the ravages of time than parchment, as soon as they are unearthed, changes in temperature and humidity often cause the clay to crumble in a relatively short period of time. And then the accounts of life in Babylon turn to dust. The inscriptions provide detailed accounts of life in the Babylon Empire. Within the finds is a record of an event that plunged the people into fear and terror over two and a half thousand years ago, an eclipse of the moon. The clay tablets tell of the day when the moon disappeared and priests all over the city had to light fires. People quickly gathered in the streets and used their clothes to shield themselves from the sight as prayers and hymns filled the entire city. The soldiers of the king dipped their hands into dark clay and smeared it over their faces, covering them entirely. Only in this way could the moon, believed by the Babylonians to be a god called Sin, be appeased. Only then would the god be prepared to show his face to mankind once more. At this small museum in Iraq, Professor Walter Sommerfeld and his colleagues study the collection of clay tablets, which are full of sensational discoveries. The weathered inscriptions are true treasures of archaeological exploration as they shed light on the lost civilization of ancient Babylon. These people, the Sumerians, Babylonians and Assyrians, were compulsive writers. They kept records of everything that could possibly be preserved in text, letters, accounts of everyday life, and also the entire body of scientific knowledge available at the time. Literature, mythology, astrology, everything we know about them has come down to us by means of clay tablets, and so far we've found about a million of them. We estimate that in the region around Iraq, there could be 100 million more buried in the ground, and only a small proportion of the texts we've found so far, about 25%, have been deciphered. With so many clay tablets holding so much information, it's hardly surprising that archaeologists are eager to preserve the legacy of Nebuchadnezzar with the aid of the latest technology. The knowledge of the ancient Orient can now be preserved on glass plates forever. Using a method called holographic photography, a laser beam traces the inscription on the clay tablet. A system of mirrors allows the image to be reproduced on a photographic plate and fixed by using a special developing process. The holographic technology has been developed at the Institute of Physics at the University of Münster. The clay tablets appear on the photographic plate in three dimensions, so that experts can study the spatial characteristics of the cuneiform script, a vital factor when deciphering the text.
The image resolution of the hologram is so detailed that even individual symbols within the text can be examined under the microscope without damaging the original in any way. And the hologram can also be made available over the internet so decoding teams can work simultaneously all around the world. The tablets with cuneiform script tell age-old stories. And now the wisdom of ancient Babylon can be presented on computer screens today. Among them are the accounts of ancient sacrificial rituals that show how far everyday life in Babylon was dominated by strong religious beliefs. The record also proves that the stories of the godless pride shown by the people of Babel as related in the Bible were nothing but hostile propaganda. In the sacrificial ritual, everything was regulated down to the smallest detail. The type of oil the priest had to wash his hands with, and the exact position he had to adopt when he examined the claws and teeth of the animal to be slaughtered. The high priest had to place a chain made of red wool and colored stones around his neck when the moon rose. Only then could the body of the animal be slit open and the liver removed. The condition of the organ indicated whether good times or bad were in store for the empire and the king. They believed that their entire future depended on how the animal's liver was interpreted. It was a divine sign. Up to a hundred years ago, Carl Dewey wrote that the ancient culture of Babylon was buried under a shroud of drifting sand. And even today, experts estimate that thousands of texts are still hidden beneath the ground in Babylon. Carl Dewey wrote, the ruins remind me of the prophet's curse in the Bible, and never more shall Babylon be inhabited, and nobody shall live there again. Did the biblical curse really come true? And could Col Dewey have guessed that a hundred years later, new methods would be developed to shed light on the mystery of Babylon, including rockets? The Russian Soyuz carried a surveillance satellite into outer space. In the days of the Cold War, the technology was employed to spy out enemy territory using photographs from space. As the shuttle raced back to Earth, there were 150 satellite pictures on board. Among them was one of an area 32 degrees north and 44 degrees east, Iraqi territory. Moscow, Leningrad Prospect 47, formerly the headquarters of Soviet military intelligence. With the Cold War over, the satellite pictures that were used to spy on enemies are now available for research purposes. The former espionage photographs from outer space are of enormous importance to aerial archaeology. An expert can learn valuable information from these bird's eye views. The outlines of structures that have long collapsed and are buried deep underground may appear in aerial shots as variations in vegetation and color. This technology has enabled archaeologists to study a small area that the satellite camera 270 kilometers away picked up. Ancient Babylon. As the computer enlarges the image, the entire area of a city that has long since vanished can be seen. In the top left is the modern palace of Saddam Hussein, 
and to the right, the region excavated by Koldui. The aerial image shows that only a small area of the ancient city has so far been studied by archaeologists. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar's city extended much further, as this satellite photograph shows. It was over 60 times larger than the reconstruction that can be seen today. And from the air, one outline can be seen very clearly. The shape of a building that was destined to become a legend, the Tower of Babel. Today, all that can be seen is a pond. The aerial image indicates that the structure was set out on a square base, so all the reconstructions made by medieval painters were simply products of their own imagination. The Tower of Babel was not a round tower, but a square structure rising in stages, probably about a hundred meters high. The great structure has appealed to the imagination of people throughout the ages. The Tower of Babel, more than the city itself, became a symbol of the unrestrained arrogance that came before the fall. Herodotus, the father of historical writing, may well have seen the Tower of Babel when half of it still remained, even though the decline of the city began almost as soon as Nebuchadnezzar's son succeeded him. At least in his mind's eye, Herodotus would have been able to picture the magnificent scene as the royal procession began to climb the tower, climbing to the blue temple at the summit, the temple of Marduk, god of the city. Herodotus reported that climbing to the temple of Marduk meant climbing into the heavens and the stars, and at the top, in the highest section of the huge layered temple, was where Marduk resided. Herodotus let his imagination run away with him and wrote that on a golden bed lies a Babylonian virgin, the consort of the god, and from time to time, the god himself appears, Marduk, the divine ruler, the great god of Babylon, the god who knows everything, who sees everything. The fantastic account Herodotus gave was a mixture of imagination and reality, which were born from the repeated stories told in Babylon as it sank into ruin. Little remains of the Babylonian temple towers today. They're just rubble. But in Borsippa, which can be seen from Babylon, the giant ruins of another tower reach up into the sky. Experts believe that these towers were not only temple complexes, but also vantage points that enabled Babylonian astronomers to study the movements of the stars. But Nebuchadnezzar and his astronomers were not merely studying natural sciences while gazing into space. They regarded the celestial bodies as gods and believed that the movements of immortal forces in the cosmos above reflected all aspects of reality down on Earth. Babylon astronomers in Nebuchadnezzar's day used huge temple complexes as vantage points to study the movements of the stars. But they were not just studying natural sciences, as they believed that celestial bodies were gods, and that the behavior of the stars, sun, moon, and the five planets known at that time offered an insight into the future of life on Earth.
the German Museum in Munich. At the planetarium, the projection system can be programmed to show how the night sky would have appeared in Babylon over two and a half thousand years ago. In the artificial sky of the planetarium, thousands of stars appear as they would have done to Nebuchadnezzar himself. Every evening, for hundreds of years, the Babylonians studied the night sky for signs, for extraordinary occurrences, and for connections. Particular stars came to be seen as part of families, like Gemini, the twins at the gateway to heaven. It was believed that Aquarius dictated the course of all waterways on Earth. Sagittarius, half man, half horse, was a powerful ally in war and times of trouble. There was Taurus, the mythical bull, who could devastate whole cities and was particularly feared. The Babylonians invented astrology as we know it today. They divided the heavens into 12 signs of the zodiac and recorded the movements of the stars. They may even have mastered the technology behind the construction of telescopes, as suggested by this polished quartz lens. The Babylonians had a sophisticated understanding of mathematics, and geometrical tablets prove that scientists were already familiar with Pythagoras' theorem. This theorem influenced the architecture of one of Babylon's most famous structures, the Blue City Gate, dedicated to the goddess Ishtar. In his telegrams to Berlin, Koldewey praised the unique beauty of the tiles, as the blue glazed bricks were packed into cases and transported to Berlin, where they were washed and sorted. The reconstruction of the Ishtar Gate began in the museum island of Berlin. After two and a half thousand years and a journey of 5,000 kilometers, the great city gate of Nebuchadnezzar was completed, and with it were many depictions of animals in a style that was very typical of Babylonian art. The images of animals worshipped by the Babylonians as companions of the gods would have graced the walls of the processional way and guided every visitor into the center of the city. And what an overwhelming impression the fresh blue tiles must have made on those who entered the city of miracles from the heat of the desert. The bricks were glazed blue, but how was it possible for such an unusual technique to be developed two and a half thousand years ago? A chemist, Stefan Fitz, submitted tile fragments from Babylon to spectrum analysis and solved the mystery. Together with ceramic specialist Andreas Fritscher, he uncovered the complex technical process involved. The initial step was very important, as a precise mix of sand and soda derived from vegetable ash had to be followed. The mixture was then fired to create a type of glass that was then used as the basis for the glaze. Today, a computer-controlled kiln is used to achieve the exact temperature of 950 degrees centigrade that is required. How the Babylonians measured and maintained this constant temperature remains a mystery. The glass was then ground into a fine powder for the next stage of the procedure. Tiny quantities of cobalt and copper oxide were added to the powder. The combination of the chemicals produced the distinctive brilliant blue color. But how could the ancient Babylonians have measured such extremely precise quantities of the minerals? Scientists today can only achieve the desired result by using pharmaceutical scales that are accurate to a milligram. Dr. Stefan Fitz then added distilled water to turn the powder into a creamy liquid, which is the finished glaze. Was die Babylonier gemacht haben bei ihr. 
What the Babylonians achieved in constructing their buildings and decorating them was an enormous technological feat, and that also applies to the glazing they used. It wasn't just the fact that they produced this glaze. You also have to remember that many of the ingredients weren't readily available in that country at the time. So a great deal had to be imported from countries that were at the other ends of the earth in contemporary terms. The enormity of what they accomplish cannot be overemphasized. The glaze was then painted onto the brick. Finally, the object was fired again, this time for 12 hours at a constant temperature of over a thousand degrees centigrade. The Babylonians were apparently masters of this brick glazing process and on a huge scale. The Ishtar gate alone was clad in over 20,000 outer bricks. This gave it a brilliant blue sheen a reflection of the sky above. The road before and after the gate was the road of the gods, the processional way, where the great New Year's festival was celebrated. This is known from the inscription stamped on the bricks, which read, for the gods Marduk and Nabu, I cement the interior of the road with asphalt and fired bricks. And over this, I place a powerful layer of glazing dust. May you gods be content as you wander along this way. Nebuchadnezzar had this message stamped on thousands of the tiles used. The Tower of Babel, the Ishtar Gate, and the processional way were all works of devotion to the gods. They were people's prayers immortalized in stone, and the laying of every foundation stone was also a precise ritual. All the foods that provided nourishment for life, oil, milk, beer, and dates, took on deep religious significance when the king and priests prepared the ground for a building in the sight of the gods. The ancient clay tablets mentioned the complex rituals and described them in great detail. Cream, honey and beer had to be poured over the first foundation stone as a valuable offering for the gods. Clay-fired statuettes, envoys of the gods, were placed on the sacred stone each of them holding a metal shaft in its hand as a symbol of divine power. A sacrificial sheep was prepared with its mouth washed out with fragrant juniper extract to encourage the gods to look favorably upon the offering. White, purified flour, the sacred fruit of the soil, was then sprinkled over the statuettes. This ensured that growth and prosperity would surround the building to be constructed. Then the statuettes were buried in the ground, the place that would soon bear the weight of the new structure. Long after the building itself has collapsed, the statuettes used in the ceremony survive to this day. Herodotus also wrote about certain rituals, but the Greek historian apparently failed to understand their significance. Though it was so long ago, the magical culture of Babylon had collapsed in ruins many years before he journeyed to the city. What remained, however, was a deep admiration for the buildings that still stood, such as the city walls. Herodotus must have fallen under their spell as experts now believe that the measurements he supplied were wildly exaggerated. Scientists are now adopting new methods to test their theory. 
In this laboratory, the seventh wonder of the world is recreated, the walls of Babylon, on a scale of one to a hundred. Laser cutters make it possible to punch out holes a thousand at a time and precisely trace the surface profile of the tiled brick walls connecting them. Never before has Babylon been recreated with the help of such modern technology. But this pioneering work is not merely being performed to produce a decorative model. It's an example of experimental archaeology and the resulting model shows immediately that the data provided by Herodotus were not correct. When the proportions he provided are employed in the construction of the model, the number of battlements, for instance, doesn't match the length of each wall as stated. The city walls didn't stretch for 96 kilometers, as Herodotus said, but only for about 19, and apart from the major structures, the brick houses of the metropolis were only one or two stories high. The experiment with the model illustrates that the streets followed a ground plan that cut through the houses almost at right angles. Babylon was constructed as a gigantic fortress. There was a 12-meter-high double wall surrounding the entire urban area. Professor Prommer and model maker Bernd Kammermeyer are convinced that with the military technology available at the time, the city would have been invincible. The Babylonians in their modest houses would have had a feeling of absolute security and an equally powerful sense of pride in their city. The camera shows the sense of awe that the ancient city dwellers must have had for the environment that dominated their everyday lives. Two thousand five hundred years ago, there was nothing in the world to compare with this picture. At the time, Rome was still a village of mud huts. Constantinople didn't exist, and it would be over 2,000 years before the first house was constructed in New York. Nebuchadnezzar proudly stated, that which no former king has done, I have achieved. Professor Walter Sommerfeld of the University of Marburg speculates at how the people who lived in this metropolis celebrated their cult festivals. Man muss sich ein Fest so vorstellen, dass im Mittelpunkt die sehr eindrucksvollen Götterbilder standen. You have to imagine a festival within an extremely impressive statue of a god in a central position. It was huge and brightly colored with ceremonial decorations. The king was there along with the high priests. There was singing by the light of the flaming torches. Something of a similar kind of religious sentiment is still found today in India. We can't take part in Babylonian festivals like this anymore, but at least there are a great many parallels in India that enable us to capture something of the atmosphere of that time. The great processional way in Babylon may have resembled this. There are considerable parallels between the religious festivals celebrated each year by the people of Puri in eastern India and Nebuchadnezzar's great New Year's festival, an ancient religious tradition that perhaps spread from Babylon to India or the other way round. The comparison of the celebrations in India with accounts written on ancient clay tablets is certainly striking. Just as in the New Year festival of ancient Babylon, the ancient statues of the gods are brought out of the temple in Puri, draped with ceremonial decorations and placed on a sacred cart. The king of Puri has been likened to a reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. 
As in Nebuchadnezzar's day, the king has to follow the customs closely, as they're the rules of the gods. Just as Nebuchadnezzar once did, he has to clean the cart in a ritual gesture. This religious ceremony serves to legitimize his rule and to renew the bond between king, god, and the people. The entire population is caught up in the euphoric ritual. Finally, everyone comes together to pull the statue of the gods through the streets, hauling it along on its massive ropes. Religion here is not an abstract concept, but something that is lived and revered every day. The hectic bustle of the carnival route in Puri is a modern reflection of the ancient rituals 2,500 years ago in Babylon. The German archaeologist Kolduy excavated part of the ancient city of Babylon in the early 1900s and continued to make new discoveries at the site for the following 18 years but he was never able to grasp at anything more than the rubble and bricks. The ancient world of the Orient remained a mystery to him. But his imagination sometimes constructed gigantic palaces from a little rubble. And he once wrote in a telegram to Berlin, I have discovered the hanging gardens of Semiramis. In fact, he had found nothing more than the extensive ruined walls around Nebuchadnezzar's southern fortress but his eagerness led him to believe that such huge walls must have supported an enormous superstructure like the Hanging Gardens as depicted in a 3,000-year-old Assyrian stone relief. Did the legendary terraced gardens of Semiramis ever exist, or was it just a fantasy created by later generations? With the aid of another model, archaeologist Professor Michael Promer discovered the Hanging Gardens could have existed the precise measurements and the carefully thought out construction indicate that this must have been a real structure. Of course we are not faced with the incredible weight of material and the need to make everything watertight, which must have been a special problem, a massive problem for the engineers of the time. And they tried everything possible, lead sheets, asphalt lining and layers of tiles and then vaults underneath. And of course we have no idea how watertight it really was, but it's an incredible project and it was never attempted again in this form. At the back the water supply was apparently fed up to the top level, and it seems that the water was allowed to seep down via these terraces, which means that the whole structure was permanently underwater. And you can see from the gigantic walls, from the thickness of the walls, in comparison to the quite narrow vaults, that they were well aware of this problem. It was thought that the roots of the trees would reach right down to the bottom, which is of course nonsense. But that's what the people thought. It must all have been filled with soil, which would mean the water would seep through. So keeping this building in a stable condition was a miracle in itself. You have to remember that. It appeared that the Hanging Garden of Semiramis was not a legend, but reality. In Iraq, there were still water wheels in use that could have brought water from the Euphrates to irrigate the gardens. A park area of this kind must have been the crowning glory of a city like Babylon. A feature of immense prestige that may well have attracted even more admiration in the blistering heat of the Orient than the Tower of Babel standing a hundred meters high. But the figure of Princess Semiramis, with whom Nebuchadnezzar is said to have fallen in love, does not stand up to historical examination. She was just a legend. <laughs> To 
Together, Princess Semiramis and her hanging gardens formed a romantic symbol of the most amazing metropolis in the ancient Orient. Ancient Babylon was a dream city of international fame and the gateway of the gods. But it was a dream that collapsed with astonishing speed. It is perhaps the greatest tragedy that the immensely powerful city walls never really had to defend Babylon against an enemy. The reign was eroded from within. Nebuchadnezzar's successor, Nabonidus, was overthrown by his own priests. And then suddenly, Babylon was little more than a footnote in the annals of history. In the end, the Bible seems to have been correct when it made the terrible prophecy, the city shall be rotten and destroyed for all time, and never more shall Babylon be inhabited, and nobody shall live there again, neither people nor cattle forevermore.